I thought I'd rather expand that. It, it was a bit sort of um, exclusionist. The nine chalk streams are uh, up on the north and west coast, and I wanted to make that a little bit wider um, to include the the Wensum and, and the Bure and the and the Tiffy and some of our other rivers. So I've changed it a little bit. Um, I've made up my own title. It's about Norfolk's chalk streams and chalk rivers, and um, some of the some of the problems that they face and some of the work that we're trying to do with a lot of other partners to, to improve their ecological health. Um, so yeah, I work for Norfolk Rivers Trust. Some of you know us, some of you don't. We're just coming up for 10 years old um, and we're, we're small but growing conservation charity. And basically we do any kind of conservation work relating to rivers and streams, um, wetlands, ponds, ditches, um, and, and anything that's got water in it and nature in it is, is something we'll have a go at improving. Um, we also do a lot of education work, um, anything from primary school through to university um, and also community work and, and farm advice and, and various other things. But watery conservation is, is really what we're about. Um, and this kind of illustrates why why we do what we do really and what our goals are so this is a caddis fly um it's a it's a norfolk species this one came out of the norfolk river i believe i don't know what species it is and i don't know what its habitat requirements are um and that's why i use it as an illustration really um if you step across a, a norfolk chalk stream in healthy condition from one side to the other you'll literally step across hundreds of different species of plant invertebrate fish um, maybe aquatic mammal all kinds of things massive biodiversity in there um, and the the point of the caddis fly is I, I don't know what its habitat requirements are and you couldn't possibly design a river to fit the habitat requirements of a caddis fly but what we try to do is create thriving healthy natural habitats and we know that if we do that, they'll support the, the full array of, of aquatic diversity that that um, we, we should see in our rivers. So that's what the caddis fly is. And that, that's what our aim is to, to create healthy, thriving, natural as possible chalk streams. Why are chalk streams special? Um, it's all about the chalk. Um, the, the chalk is, is absolutely what makes them. Um, we, we classify anything anything as a chalk stream if it rises from chalk, if it runs over chalk. So a lot of Norfolk's chalk streams you wouldn't say were pure, but they've got a lot of chalk influence. And the chalk runs in a band. Sorry, I'm waving my arms around thinking you can all see what I'm waving at. But the, the chalk runs in a band sort of down eastern England, through Yorkshire, down into Norfolk, um, down through Cambridgeshire, Buckinghamshire, and then down to kind of the classic chalk downs and chalk rivers of Wiltshire and Hampshire and Dorset. Um, you can you can see it um, coming up through the cliffs there. And these are these are the some of the many Norfolk chalk streams and rivers. So World Wildlife Fund have, have um, audited and, and categorised all the UK's chalk streams and rivers. This is a selection of the Norfolk ones. Probably I think I've got all the, the most well-known ones on um, the, the kind of classics like the Wensum and, and the, the Stiffkey, possibly the best known chalk streams, but also a lot of the River Bure is chalky, the River Wissey is a great chalk river in places um, and over in West Norfolk there, there's some absolute gems, little, little not particularly well-known rivers but really beautiful where, the, where they rise in the springs fresh out of the chalk, rivers like the Gaywood and the, the upper end of the River Nar and the Babingley um, absolutely beautiful in places but pretty much anywhere in Norfolk the, the rivers are influenced by the chalk right down going into the broads they're not necessarily running over chalk or chalk fed down there but in, in their early stages up in the highlands of Norfolk I suppose that they're, they're born as chalk streams very often and what that means is the chalk slows and filters the water so unlike I don't know granite catchments in Scotland or clay catchments in, in Western England. Chalk streams don't particularly have a, or shouldn't particularly have a, a great deal of runoff coming into them. They shouldn't respond particularly to rain. What happens is the, the rainwater percolates down into the chalk and then it rises up and squeezes out of fissures 
maybe years, maybe hundreds of years later, it, it sits in this massive chalk aquifer and pushes itself out all over the place. And the, the chalk's a massive filter. So what we should have in chalk streams is clean water. It should percolate down into the chalk, the chalk filters it and it comes out clean. We should have a, a relatively constant flow. They're, they're like a sponge. They should be very absorbent and slow releasing, which means they shouldn't be subject to the, the, the droughts and the floods that um, other kind of flashier catchments are subject to. Um, the water should also have a, a reasonably constant temperature. It comes out in a, in a range of sort of two to eight degrees out of the chalk. Um, and the, the water should also be very mineral rich, rich in calcium and magnesium. Um, poor in nutrients like phosphates and nitrates, I'll talk about that later, but rich in minerals like calcium and magnesium. And what this means is all these things together, the clean water, the constant flow, the temperature, the lack of floods and droughts and that, that mineral richness make, makes a fantastic growing environment for aquatic plants. Um, things like the, the water crow foot, the ranunculus in the picture there. So we've got this really kind of stable, clean and brilliant growing environment for plants. And that in turn creates a brilliant environment for aquatic invertebrates, things like mayflies and caddisflies. Um, not so much stoneflies in Norfolk, they, they require water, but mollusks in there are absolutely amazing. Um, things like crayfish as well. All, all these things really thrive in this environment created by the clean water and the plants. And that kind of works its way up into the food chain to give us amazing fish populations and, and birds feeding off those fish and otters and, and so on. So really, really kind of rich, diverse environments we're talking about. Um, they are globally rare. So chalk doesn't come to the surface at this sort of latitude in too many places. Again, pinching from the World Wildlife Fund report, they, they've listed 210 chalk streams worldwide. So it's basically us and um, a bit of France and, and, um, and a little bit of Belgium, I think. Um, Norfolk's got at least 25 of those, depending on what you call a river or a stream and, and how, how important you think the, the chalk feed is to classifying it. So we, we've got a, a good, good proportion of, of the whole world's chalk streams. Um, and I think that's, that's a little bit underappreciated, actually, um, especially by chalk stream conservationists focusing on Hampshire and, and Wiltshire and the more glamorous rivers, possibly. There's a huge list of threats to them. So everything that makes them good for aquatic biodiversity pretty much makes them good for farming as well. There's a, there's a good steady supply of clean water. Um, we, we tend to have reasonably good soils. We're, we're not particularly flood and drought prone. Um, so everything that's, made uh, everything that's made these environments attractive to other wildlife has also made it attractive to humans for millennia. Um, so they, they do suffer from a, a lot of modification, um, abstraction for agriculture and drinking water, um, and also pollution as a, as a result of various human activities. But they do remain in places a proper wind in the willows environment. Um, and I, I tend to use this slide no matter who I'm talking to, whether it's a a primary school or a village hall thing or a university thing or North Norwich naturalists. Because um, I, th I think it illustrates quite well what, what we're talking about. I think everybody associates with the waterfall and knows roughly what a what an English slow and chalk stream should look like. I, I really like the top right picture as you look at it there. That shows the real wealth of plant life and, and the diversity of it actually. Um, and the, the other thing that this, this slide illustrates is Norfolk in particular is, is still home to a lot of the species that are really suffering elsewhere. Things like water voles. Um, water voles have disappeared from a huge amount of their English range in the last 20 to 30 years, um, in, in large part because of mink, but also due to a lot of, a lot of habitat loss as well and habitat mismanagement. Um, but Norfolk has still got some some pretty good waterfall populations. We're also just about holding on to the white clawed crayfish. Um, it's, it's a little bit touch and go. Um, again, that's disappeared from a huge amount of its English range and a huge amount of its Norfolk range, actually. When I started at Norfolk Rivers Trust, um, we had reasonable remnants of populations in, in the Wensum. 
um, and the River Tud and various other places. Um, but American signal crayfish are, are absolutely decimating our native populations everywhere. It's, it's like the red and the grey squirrels. They outcompete them, they carry a plague, um, and they're, they're just much bigger, tougher creatures. Um, so they're they're declining fast, but we, we still still have a, a a couple of Norfolk strongholds. Um, so, yeah, re really valuable corners of, of habitat. Still retaining some of the wildlife that's really struggling elsewhere. Um, so, and, and as I said, the the qualities that make our trout stream so great for nature also make them great for agriculture. Um, and this is a kind of typical view of, of a Norfolk chalk stream catchment. They are very, very heavily arable. Um, the, the land's pretty much farmed at every, every inch that can be farmed is farmed. Um, and it's allowed us to produce a huge amount of food and we, and we continue to do that. I think Norfolk produces more food than any other English county. I think that's, I think that's correct. Um, but that that certainly does have impacts on our rivers. So that, that's that's a typical view of a, a, I guess the the landscapes that we're talking about. Um, but also, we we do retain these little corners of amazing wildness. Um, this picture is taken in the headwaters of a tributary of, of the River Babingley. So this is where one of the springs rises up, and we, we've still got these little pockets all around the place that are just pretty much left undisturbed with with pristine water quality um, and loads of loads of I think this picture shows loads of sycamore actually but, but loads of thriving native vegetation generally speaking um, the the pockets of wildness are still there um, the, there's a lot that we can still protect and a lot that we can allow to, to expand and recover if we if we know how um, just excuse me we'll have a drink a sec and you enjoy the glory of the fish pictures. So, yeah, terrifically rich environments. Um, fish are, are often what attract people to, to rivers. They're kind of the, the glamour boys and girls of the streams and the most sort of noticeable wildlife, I guess. Um, and th this is a bit of a selection of the fish that we typically find in, in the, the bigger north of chalk streams and rivers. Um, certainly the Bure and the Wensum and the Wissy. Um, we've got the, so the, the absolute classic is the brown trout. That's kind of the, the, the one right in the centre, really speckly. Um, that should be in every, every Norfolk and England chalk river and river generally, actually. Um, they, they should be absolutely everywhere. They, they absolutely love chalk rivers. But we've got various other things. We've got the, the roach and the rud in the kind of slower, deeper stretches. We've got the, the, perch the, the predator which is top right as you look at it um and we've got some quite cool other things we've got the, the bullhead i particularly like that's a good chalk stream species that's that's bottom left as you look at the picture it's not not a particularly attractive looking fish it's a it's an ambush predator that spends its life living under rocks and um ambushing passing mayfly but um it, that that really when, when you find bullhead in your river you know that the river's probably in reasonably decent condition um and then more mysterious things like we've got possibly three species of lamprey i hope we've got three species of lamprey um lampreys on the bottom right there with the, the sucker disc and the and the gill portals we've certainly got brook lamprey which are uh, in most of our most of norfolk's rivers actually um their cousins the the river and sea lamprey they're the ones that you see on pictures attached to sharks and cod and salmon and things with the with the sucker disc. Um, brook lamprey are a little bit more modest. Um, they they don't they don't parasitize in the, in their adult stage. They filter feeders as as they're young and then they they come out and um, and spawn as that one is doing. They dig the little nest in the gravel. And then a personal favorite of Norfolk Rivers Trust is is the eel. These things. They're just absolutely amazing. Um, they, they spawn in the Sargasso Sea, um, so all the way across the Atlantic, drift over as tiny little larvae. And by the time they reach Blakeney Harbour or, or Great Yarmouth or anywhere on the Norfolk coast, they're, they're just kind of little, I don't know, eight to 10 centimetre glass eels that they've made that journey all the way across the Atlantic. 
mostly on currents um, and they, they get washed all over the entire coast. They can spend years and years in our, in our rivers and ponds and lakes um, feeding and growing before they're ready to make that journey back. But um, I, I, like, I like the link they, they kind of give us with the, with the wider world. So that's a selection of our fish species, um, which leads on to an, an illustration of one of our many, many problems. Um, Norfolk's got, it's, it's got two things. So Norfolk's got seawall and the seawall excludes a lot of migratory fish species from, from running up our rivers. The sluices make it difficult. But also Norfolk's got a long history of, of, of mills of various kinds. <clears throat> And with the mills come sluices and the sluices block the way for migratory fish and most fish so th things like salmon and eel are, are very obvious migrators but less obvious things that that migrate just locally to to complete their life cycles so sticklebacks make make little journeys things like dace make little journeys and every time you cut these off you, you're cutting populations of fish out of out of the upstream section of the river and not only do you do that, if you're cutting up the river, you're cutting up the populations and making them more vulnerable to local extinction. So if you lose a population of bullhead in between two mills, there's no way they're ever coming back. And what the red line shows is that this, this was a really clear illustration when we're doing some fish survey work. This was upstream and downstream of a, it, it was a mill on the, on the river Nar. The species on the right above the, above the, jagged red line they're all present in the whole river above the mill the whole way up the river they're present everywhere immediately downstream of, of that mill so within tens of meters of them but completely unable to recolonize the top of the river we've got a whole list of other things we've got gudgeon that aren't getting up there sea trout um lamprey aren't there uh, roach rudd dace spined loach stone loach um, eels are even struggling a bit. Eels are upstream, but they're, they're only just making it. So that's, that's one of our major problems, and it's really reducing our, our fish diversity in the, in the upper reaches of a lot of these rivers. And as I said, the sea walls, the sea walls, and the, and the sluice gates are, are cutting out a, a whole load of other things that, that should be using our streams. So a lot of these species, things like flounder, flounder is a sea fish. But they do use they use estuaries and these rivers and they'll run a long long way up rivers um probably naturally up to up to about as far as norwich if, if they were if they were free to migrate up the um up, up the broadland rivers um also things like salmon norfolk I, I assume would have had salmon um years and years ago before we cut them out at sea shad they're the, the spotty species um, smelt, one of our favourites, these, these live at sea but they spawn in the rivers. Um, they are there in Blakeney Harbour and some of them do sneak through the sluices up, up, into, up into the Glave and the Stiffkey, the Babbing Lee, um, also the Wensum and the Yare, but they're prevented by various barriers from making the full migratory journeys. So we've got all these things, they're still hanging on, we've still got these populations there and if we can find ways to open our rivers to these species, to take out some of the mills and sluices, we, we can really um, we, we can really do good things to, to help our fish populations. And th this sort of led, led me on to, to thinking about rivers as migratory pathways. Um, and it kind of became obvious when I was, I was looking at maps a few months ago, this is the river Gadda. It's a tributary of the Wissey over in West Norfolk. Um, and I was looking at it for nothing to do with fish migration at all. I, was, I can't remember what I was doing, but I was looking at it and it's, it's really kind of obvious, but the, the green and the blue just, just line up really nicely. So wherever we've got the streams, we've also got the bits of land that have been too wet to ever farm. So they've, they've very often been left as wet woodland, sometimes meadow, and the, the green and the blue sit side by side on these maps. And the rivers really do create corridors of habitat through the landscape for, for not just fish, but for everything. And you can see it as well from satellite imagery. So this is the, the river Nar, and you can kind of see a green corridor snaking its way through the, the drier, higher arable land there from left to right or, or right to left, whichever way you look at it. And when you plot where the river actually is over that, it, be, it becomes quite clear. It, it's a corridor through the landscape. And 
I suspect, although I, I don't know if anybody's ever gathered all this together, that these corridors, I don't have the right slide in there, but I suspect that these corridors are used by a whole a whole host of, of migratory things. So bats, with we, we know, use river corridors. Migratory birds, I, I would imagine, use the river corridors pretty heavily for, for migration. And if you're migrating over Norfolk, you, you're going to follow the pathways where the food are. So where the rivers are and, and the wet woodland and the wet meadows, that's where the invertebrates still are. There's, there's not much food on the arable land. It's in the river corridors. And there aren't many places to perch on the arable land. That's that's also pretty much in the river corridors. So things like that. But also we have migrations of we have migratory butterflies. We've got migratory dragonflies. I don't know if anybody knows, but I, I wouldn't be at all surprised to find out that I think wind will be, uh, you know, that that'll have a much more of an effect on them. But I wouldn't be surprised to find that they're also using these habitat corridors as as they make their way inland. So not just important for the river wildlife at all, it's, it's also very much about what lives on the floodplain and what uses the floodplain and, and what uses these remaining wild corridors in the landscape. Um, moving on to invertebrates, this is a, a bit like the fish slide. It's, I, I just wanted to give you a bit of an idea of the diversity that we've got really. So people like the Environment Agency and sometimes us, um, we use river invertebrates as monitors and and guides to how healthy our rivers are and the reason we do that is the, the rivers have got such a diversity of invertebrate life as i said if you step from one bank to another bank of a river you'll be literally stepping over hundreds of species and um, each of those species has got slightly different habitat requirements whether that's in terms of how fast they like the water to flow or how much oxygen they need or how much of a particular pollutant they'll tolerate or anything like that. Every single species has got slightly different habitat requirements. Um, so if you if you get a picture of the, the full suite of species living in a particular section of river, that will really give you a lot of information about how healthy that river is. Maybe what's maybe it's recent history in terms of pollution, maybe drought, siltation. Um, and there's, there's a lot of information to be had there. And that's because the diversity is so great. Um, we've got some really cool things that, that I think um, might appeal to, to this audience, like the Damelands wall snails. Um, they're a bit, a bit of a Norfolk classic. The Wensum Valley in particular seems quite rich for those. Critically endangered across Europe, um, but reasonably common in Norfolk. Um, so these kind of things as well, just, just sort of show what, what special environments we've got and we're dealing with. Um, banded demoiselles are in there, they're, they're just particularly glamorous damselflies, really. <laughs> I don't think they're particularly rare, but they are absolutely beautiful. They'll, they'll start to emerge, I don't know, it's, it's a bit hard to tell this year, but um, in two weeks time or four weeks time, you get clouds of these over, over nice little patches of river. Um, we, we use those as well, actually, because most dragonflies and damsels don't like flowing water. Um, they'll stick to ponds and lakes and backwaters and things. But demoiselles are a bit more river friendly, so they're, they're a bit of a river classic as far as dragonflies go. Um, and something that, that just uh, uh, amazes me, I, I absolutely love, are the, are the caddis flies. Um, the cased caddis flies in particular that, that build their little houses. Um, they're, they're just amazing things and, and different species will, will build the homes out of different materials and they'll build them in different styles so some will build straight cases for themselves and some will build really scruffy cases that presumably are well camouflaged and some will just use one building material like bits of vegetation or or bits of sand and others will use a whole a whole kind of mass of, of things and just the the variety of them is amazing and how they build these homes and carry them around with them and it's, I find it amazing as well that a, a particular species somehow selects the same building materials as all the other individuals in that species, but its close caddis relative will choose something completely different and they're consistent in that. Um, yeah, pretty cool. So that's, that's really just a, um, an illustration of kind of the invertebrate diversity that we've got, just a tiny, tiny snapshot. 
Um, so we have these amazing environments, but they they absolutely do have problems. Um, the, this is environment agency data on chalk streams in England. Um, anything this is from 2013, um, but anything green is, is rated as being good ecological condition. Um, that orange colour is moderate, moderate is not good, and the purple colour is, is poor to bad, which means it's, it's really pretty poor. Um, and you can see the general state, especially if you ignore that bit on the south coast, the kind of, um, I guess, Hampshire and Wiltshire upper catchments, the, the, the rivers really are, are not in good condition. Um, and they've got the, the, the reasons for these failures are, are pretty consistent, actually. It's quite a consistent suite of ecological damage that we're, that we're looking at. Um, I constantly, every, every time I talk about this, I kind of re-rank and re-categorise all these problems, but they, they really are the same problems on every river. Um, the Environment Agency also ranked them, and uh, yeah, I don't know if ranking helps, but barriers we, we've already talked about, so mills and sluices, cutting up rivers, cutting up habitats, cutting up migratory corridors, that's a massive problem, and that completely excludes a lot of wildlife and prevents other species completing their lifestyles because they're not able to migrate. So that's a huge problem. It also changes how a river behaves. Suddenly you're slowing it down and you're trapping sediment and then you're releasing water unnaturally quickly and the, the gradient of the river becomes stepped instead of a smooth flow down a valley. Completely changes how a river behaves. So that, that's, a, that's an ecological disaster. Um, quite, quite a severe one for Norfolk is, is the lack of functioning floodplains. We've worked really hard to, to make our land more, more productive for crops and, and to drain it better and better year on year. And in doing that, we're, we're digging the rivers deeper and trying to get the water away faster. Um, and the, the rivers effectively become drainage channels. And the, the deeper you dig it, the less chance it has of spilling out onto its floodplain, which is the, that, that's the aim of it. But ecologically, that, that's a disaster. Rivers need wet floodplains to store water, to deposit silt and nutrients, to wash seeds onto. Um, wildlife needs that kind of the, the, the wet zone between the river and the dry land. Um, and what we've got in, in a lot of places on a lot of Norfolk rivers at the moment is, is no intermediate wet zone. You've got river and then immediately onto dry land. And that kind of merging zone in between is completely lost. That's really ecologically important. Um, silt coming off farmland and roads, that, that's a massive problem. That smothers the gravels. These rivers are, are often naturally gravel bed rivers and the gravels are where a lot of the fish spawn and where the invertebrates hang out. The, the gravels are a real key habitat in there. And if we have too much silt in the rivers and the rivers are straightened and deepened, they can't deal with that. And it smothers them like carpet and, and really chokes the life out. Not, not to be depressing, I'll, I'll come on to the more <laughs> cheerful bits shortly. Um, straightening, similar to deepening, we, we've done that as well for sound agricultural reasons. We, we've straightened our rivers, a, a straight line is easier to plough, it's easier to fence, it takes up less room. But in straightening then we cut out the meanders and when you cut out the meanders you cut out the diversity of the habitat. As, as the water sweeps around the meander it creates shallow water and deep water and fast water and slow water and silty bits and gravelly bits. If you straighten the river, you lose all that diversity. Um, and as, as I said a minute ago, every species that, that lives in these rivers, every single one of the hundreds of species has slightly different habitat requirements. And if you simplify that habitat, you're losing all these little kind of edge habitats that so many of these species need. And you're really, you, you're simplifying a whole ecosystem and, and compressing the diversity that will sustain massively. Um, nutrient balance, to, to me, this, this is one of our biggest problems at the moment. Um, well, not just to me, actually, to, to the Environment Agency and, and any river ecologist. Um, <coughs> but we are pumping our rivers full of nutrients, partly from agriculture, but mostly from sewage works. Um, it's, it's mostly phosphate. There's a lot of nitrate in the groundwater and what it does is it unbalances ecosystems. It's like um, putting liquid fertilizer into the rivers. 
some things, um, algae and, and some plants will exploit that really well and absolutely thrive on it. Not find nice native species thriving on it. But when they do that, they're out competing the other things that are less tolerant. Um, and it's, it, it tips the balance of an ecosystem. And again, it simplifies the whole ecosystem and it, it leads to an eventual loss of diversity. Um, that's something that I'll, I'll come back to in a sec. That's something we're working really hard to do something about. Um, invasive species, you'll, you'll know all about, so I won't really dwell on that, but signal crayfish and main can Himalayan balsam and Japanese knotweed are all, all problems for us. And then we've on, on top of that, we've got climate change, we've got poor management, we've got constant abstraction. Um, absolutely not to blame farmers for this because we, we all eat potatoes. And on top of that, the vast majority of abstraction goes to household and business usage. So people think farmers are abstracting too much. It's, it's not the farmers, it's all of us. Um, and continuing habitat loss as well for, for various reasons, um, development quite often. All problems, um, but all things we can we can do something about. Um, at, at the moment, we're, we're working on the River Stiffkey a lot and the River Wensum a lot, and we're trying to address the loss of good quality headwater habitats, these wild spaces. Um, you can see the, the bottom left as you look at it. In fact, all, the, all these are spring sites. These are all springs where various rivers are rising. Um, I think mostly in West Norfolk, the bottom right I know is the Gaywood, top right I think is the Babingley, bottom left I can't remember but I think it's possibly the, the Wissey. So the West Norfolk rivers generally, they, these are springs and wild places where water is really pushing up out of the ground and, and welling up. We've lost so much of that, the, the headwaters of our streams are absolutely knackered because a, a, a tiny little stream or a tiny little wetland is much easier to, to drain and farm or drain and build on than a, than a big river and if you if you think of a river as kind of an upside down tree actually the, the vast majority of habitat should be in those headwaters so to lose that to, to drainage is, is an absolute aquatic ecology disaster but something that we can work to put back. Um, this has been one of our more popular things recently and this is kind of a, a, a lot of what, what we're trying to achieve at the moment. We, we used to target kind of the more glamorous middle reaches of river for river restoration, which is which is brilliant and we, we still do that. But we've learned now that we really can do stuff about the headwaters. We, we, we used to look at streams that had just become tiny ditches and think, well, what can you really do with that? But then we started to realize that it's not just about the, the bed of the stream or the bed of the river it's about the the banks and the floodplain and everything around it and it really is worthwhile rest restoring these little sections so on, on the left is a kind of typical Norfolk what is now a ditch but was once a stream or a wetland beforehand and we're working on raising the beds and we, we can do this in different ways so we, we can either recut that whole ditch block it and recut a nice new meandering channel through it or we can put woody dams in it which is what we did on this one on the right and just get it to hold more water and bring the bed of the stream back up to floodplain level. Um, I'm kind of waving my hands again, which I appreciate you can't see, but one of the key things here is we're raising the water levels in the meadows so that the whole meadow acts as a sponge and we recreate those kind of damp habitats that are neither dry nor wet. And th this is a big target for us at the moment. Um, we, we still absolutely want to do the, the glamour jobs. This is a kind of mid-river re-meandering at, at Bayfield that one or two of you might have seen. Um, so we, we can do this. this. This bit of river used to run through a brickwork tunnel a kilometre long. You can see the remnants of the tunnel. Just about mid-screen there's a, there's a dead tree in the meadow in a straight bit of channel where the, where the tunnel's collapsed. That tunnel ran for a, a thousand metres down the side of the lake. Complete dead zone for, for aquatic wildlife and probably quite hard not, not impossible, but hard to migrate through. For we, we know eels were getting through. I don't know if trout ever made it through there. Pretty much nothing else ever would. Um, we replaced that with, with so we replaced a kilometre of tunnel with a mile of meandering river. Um, that's quite a dramatic example, but we, we can do that with just straight and generally damaged bits of rivers. 
you can almost always find old old meanders and old oxbow lakes they're still visible in the landscape particularly now with drone photography and, and satellite imagery you can find these bits that, that still sit wet and reconnect them and work out where the river used to be and it's not actually about the meanders that's not that's not really why why we're doing it um uh, you know it, it looks more natural and it looks nice um especially once it's established this picture's from when the project was brand new but it's about putting back that diversity of habitat so suddenly you've got fast and slow water again and shallow water and deep water again all and just a more complex environment that supports a lot more wildlife that's what we're trying to do put back the habitat diversity and one of the absolute best ways to do that that's cheap and simple and easy and massively effective is to put trees just fell trees into rivers um, this isn't one we did this is kind of a role model for a lot of the stuff we do that this is this is what happens when a, a tree falls in a river you can see how it breaks up the flow immediately you've got a little cascade over it it'll scour out a pool below it um, it's holding water back slightly upstream of it and the, the wood provides all sorts of other benefits. So you get a much more natural flow pattern in the in the channel. You get the fast and slow water and the shallow and deep, and it becomes dynamic again. But also the wood is physical shelter for things. Things live in and on the wood. Um, it's, it's protection from predation. Um, the wood is a food source in itself. It, it rots and various things will eat the wood. And also it traps dead vegetation and creates like, it creates leaf packs and, and packs of dead vegetation that are absolutely rammed with things like freshwater shrimp and, and caddis flies and all these shredders and, and detritivores living in there. And doing that really, really brings a river to life and it's really easy. Um, we've had landowners apologise several times that they've not bothered to pull a, a fallen tree out of a river. Um, and we're kind of slowly getting the message across, please don't do that because they're absolutely amazing. So that, that, that's one of the absolute most basic, simple things we, we can do, and we can do that pretty much anywhere. We've kind of moved on a stage from that recently. Um, we're, we're massive fans of beavers um, and what beavers do for rivers. Um, and beavers are now back in Norfolk on, on the Ken Hill estate, which is fantastic. Um, we hope they'll be back in North Norfolk soon. We're, we're applying for a license to do that, but they're in an enclosure um we, it, it, which is a step forward it, it's not ideal we'd like to see a free release but that is a step forward but there are bits of river that we just won't ever get to release a beaver on um the wensum possibly being one of them um the there are fears about what happens if the beavers get into the broads or particularly actually the fens if they go the other way if, if they head south and west um a lot of the fenland rivers are actually perched up above the landscape and if something burrowed through the river banks, that would be Cambridgeshire underwater and nobody really wants that. So on, on those rivers, we, we've started trying to mimic what beavers do and build beaver dams. Um, this is a view from above. This is a Wensum tributary here, um, Wendling Beck actually. And th so th this, this was a straight kind of boring damaged bit of river. And we, we started to, <coughs> excuse me, build a series of beaver dams along it. To recreate that fast and slow habitat so beavers hold huge amounts of water in the landscape huge amounts of water and they create standing water in a river catchment as well and, and standing water is that the right word still water still water is the right word still water su supports a whole different array of wildlife to, to running water and rivers and streams and to have the two side by side and working together is is really amazing suddenly you get proper habitat complexity and you get species living side by side that would otherwise be separated in our kind of humanized landscape. So we're building these, these beaver dams where we can, and we were looking at the Environment Agency, let's get away with this a, a little bit actually, but they did. Um, and they're amazing, they work really well, and they trap silt. And over time, they build up the riverbed back towards the floodplain, and we've got the fast and the slow water, and we've suddenly got aquatic plants that thrive in still water rather than streams then immediately downstream we've got the stuff that likes the faster flowing water so we've got habitat diversity we're holding water back where it's not causing a problem in the floodplain and bringing a, bringing a, a whole load of benefits no, nothing like a, 
actual beaver family could do but um i think not bad for um a couple of guys and somebody with a digger and a chainsaw it's it's a, a quick and nice way to help restore rivers um this is another one and they're just starting to look like nice nice habitats um and i was, I was talking about finding oxbow lakes and, and meanders in the landscape and we could put those back as well this is an old well, i don't know if it was an oxbow if it was a well it was probably an oxbow and a meander at some point um it, it, it was filled in not for any real reason just somebody was straightening the river and the old meander was a was a very good place to get rid of a load of spoil um so it, it was filled in and forgotten about but we could still see it and we excavated it and again it just it holds water in the environment and, and creates that standing still water habitat and it's come out really nicely it's, it's come out with some really quite nice plant life quite interesting invertebrates in there um we had an archaeological scare we found a mound of, of burnt flints which means it was used as a, a stone age or iron age site at some point so we had to get the archaeologist out which is fairly common actually but yeah we, we can recreate these features and, and start to rebuild these habitats and we little by little we, we, we are we are doing this stuff um similar thing here so the the new thing in river restoration is is braided channels um we've, we've kind of worked out that rivers shouldn't just be single channels making their way through the landscape there should be wetlands and side channels and and all these other features and so the, this this was our first go at this actually putting in a a higher level channel so th this is a different when some tributary but when it floods what happens is is well, you can see where the existing river channel is kind of through the center of the picture but when it really rains we, we've set this up to push water into this little pond here and then down this side channel so suddenly we've got two river channels coming through and again that's holding water in the environment and pushing it out onto the floodplain and it's no bad thing if, if that dries up in summer seasonal water courses are, are just as ecologically valuable as, as permanently wet water courses. Um, that works for ponds, but also to an extent, um, winterborne rivers as well. So it's, it's just creating more habitat, holding more water in the landscape and just really widening the, widening the river corridor, widening the habitat associated with the river. Going back to the nutrients, this is a big, big problem. The, the vast majority of our rivers are, are failing to meet their ecological targets because of the amount of nutrients coming into them. And the majority of those nutrients are coming from sewage works. And big sewage works are, are well regulated and pretty clean and generally not bad considering that they're taking the poo of tens of thousands of people. Um, they're, they're well regulated and looked after and pretty modern. Um, I think much more troublesome are the, are the smaller, older sewage works that are less well regulated and don't really have any, any nutrient limits that they, they can put out um, quite high concentrations. Um, and because they're small, there, there isn't very much legislative pressure to, to do much about them. So, um, you know, a, a big sewage works on the Wensum is going to attract a lot of attention and going to have some pretty strict limits on it and do a pretty good job. But a smaller sewage works on a less well-known river isn't really going to be regulated particularly well. Um, so a, a few times now recently, we've, we've started building wetlands below sewage works. So instead of the works discharging straight to the river, and we've done this at a couple of sites, we've now built these wetlands, you can see, and we've we've effectively pinch the water out of the sewage works it doesn't go to the river anymore it comes down through this this series of wetlands this is quite new it's not fully established yet so there's still a lot of open water and what it does is that the plants and the, and the microbial life in there are great cleansers of water they're very hungry for nutrients they'll eat up with a lot of the stuff coming out of the works also it's an amazing physical filter for things like maybe not microplastics, but macroplastics, but a, a small plastics down to a certain scale. So we know that the, these wetlands trap microplastics. They also process some pharmaceuticals. Um, so coming out of sewage works, we've got things like oh, antidepressants, painkillers, um, hormones for birth control. Um, I don't know if I just said antibiotics, but certainly antibiotics. 
And then we've got other things that come through washing machines like fire retardants and microplastics and all this stuff coming through. And what we found from, the, from research and published literature is wetlands will clean up pretty much any of that. Not perfectly, they're, they're, not, they're not perfect by any means, but the, the ones we found, so we're, we're reducing the amount of phosphate getting into rivers by between 60 and 90 percent. Um, could possibly do better on phosphate, which is what they're designed for, but all these additional benefits of cleaning up the pharmaceuticals, the fire retardants, the microplastics, the ammonia, sediment, all these things, amazing cleansers, and they're recreating wet habitat where there was none. So our rivers should be whole corridors of wetlands and the wetlands are pretty much gone and we're starting to put those back. Um, this is what the wetlands look like new. They attract loads of wildlife, so the, the very good for stuff like dragonflies and amphibians. Um, there's a, there's a, what's the word, a, a, a wealth of um, flies rising off them in summer. Um, and that obviously attracts a lot of things like warblers and swallows and house and sand martins and um, uh, migratory birds in particular, in, insectivorous birds. Um, anything that eats insects, anything that eats seeds, uh, great habitat for. This is what they look like when they're a little bit better established, um, just a, a, an absolute mass of, of vegetation and an amazing, very hungry physical and, and biological filter. Um, I think we, we start to lose some of the wildlife richness as they mature because certain species start to dominate. So the next step might be to look at, at resetting those and how we can maximize them for treatment and wildlife as, as, they, as they mature. Um, a couple of things to, to leave you with, things we're working on at the moment. I've mentioned we're, we're in the midst of an application to bring beavers back to an enclosure for now on the River Glaven. Um, I'm a slightly bitter about the enclosure. I, I want them free. Um, and the, the reason we're so keen on beavers, it, it's not, I mean, it's, it's great to have a native species back. That's brilliant. But it, it, it's, it's what they do, how they transform habitats, how they, they create wetlands, they create ponds. They create amazing waterfall habitat, amphibian habitat, dragonfly habitat, um, reptile habitat, you, you name it, pretty, pretty much anything that lives in a, in a river valley thrives when, when beavers are present. But also the great water cleansers. Um, beaver dams trap a massive amount of sediment. They, they trap a massive amount of the phosphate that comes with the sediment. A lot of that gets processed by the vegetation in the pond and, and growing on the dams and things. So. We really want them back for, for what they do for our rivers as, as much as what they are in themselves. Um, and the bottom picture is a, that, that's a burbot, Norfolk's great lost fish, um, extinct in from, from Norfolk in the UK in about, 90, well, the last one was caught in 1968 or nine. So presumably they lived on into the seventies, but uh, relatively recently, um, the, the Wissy was a stronghold for these, but also the Broadland Rivers. We're having a look at bringing these back at the moment. There have been various feasibility studies over the last few years. Um, University of Southampton, um, primarily, I guess, all, all suggesting it's possible with, with the, they, could, the, they could be reintroduced and thrive. And reintroductions have worked for Berber in Belgium and Germany and France. So that, that gives us hope it's possible. So that's something else we're looking at. That, that's a bit of a view to the future, possibly. Um, and I think that is, that's the end of the, the formal talk there. So thank you very much. I don't think I've avoided my kids bedtime yet. So um, <laughs> the reams of questions are, are, are very welcome. Um, I'll, I'll stop the share and uh, thanks for listening and please ask anything you like. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jonah. Um, I, I was going to say um, on, on my comments, another benefit of, of beavers is just how absolutely adorable they are. But I know that's <laughs> that's not that's not a valid reason. Um, well, no, it is. They make people feel good. So why not? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yes, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Very interesting. And I don't know what you're worried about at the start. Um, it's very engaging. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of um, knowledge in the group as well. So I'll, um, I'll open the floor to any questions. I can't see any that have come out in the chat. So if people want to unmute themselves, pop their cameras back on and, and, and dive in, that'd be great. I 
I don't know about any questions. I think you covered most things, to be honest with you, uh, Jonah, that uh, you didn't leave room for any questions, to be honest. Uh, you've answered most things. The only, the only sort of comment that I would give is um, I spent some time uh, a number of years ago on the Gaspé Peninsula in Canada. And uh, one of the things that uh, I, I was studying and photographing there were beaver. And uh, or castor, as they call them out there, castors. And uh, they were absolutely horrified uh, that we were introducing beaver into the UK without having any predators. What would be your comment on that? Hmm. So I think we need very good management plans to, to make it acceptable. So as a river ecologist, it's it's great to have them everywhere. But as a as a farmer or a manager of <clears throat> maybe a, a wildlife reserve looking after a particularly rare habitat or as a town drainage planner, they're, they're not they're not at all welcome everywhere. There's no doubt about that. Um, not least because they'll eat crops and flood low lying farmland. Um, and they cause conflict. So I think we need the ability to manage them. Um, my my choice would always be intervention rather than um, shooting them as, as you can get a license to do still in Scotland, I think. But I, I think we can do that. Um, I, I, I think we can manage that, Carl. Um, it seems to be manageable in Europe. Um, and we know, so the, the, the beavers that come, came to Ken Hill, for example, their problem beavers that were, that were trapped in the River Tay catchment in, in Scotland and moved on to a more appropriate home. So that's one option. You, you can manage the dams if it's if it's the damming in particular that's causing a problem. You can fit they're called beaver deceivers. You can like a, it's just a pipe that fools the beaver into thinking its dam's working fine, but actually you're, you're holding the water level down. So um, I think it needs work. Yeah, definitely, and they, they can cause a lot of problems. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to say we, we should introduce wolves and lynx, but <laughs> maybe just it, in Bedford Forest. It would be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, they, they, they need some management. Yeah, they do. Otherwise, they do, they do cause problems. Yeah. From from the point of view of uh, of introduction, um, has any sort of study back study been done on what went wrong with uh, the the koi pew um, infestation that the broad suffered at any stage because the two were uh, uh, structurally uh, and um, habit wise quite similar um, and they do cause similar sorts of damage uh, to riverbanks um, and looking through the the mammal files at the um, at the uh, Norfolk archives, it's possible to uh, to sort of trace the spread of koi pew right up from the broads, right up to uh, where they were nesting in the cliffs at Mundersley. So uh, they they did spread pretty rapidly and perhaps beyond what everyone else would have thought. And I wondered if if there could be some lessons learned from that that the by studying the spread. Of um, of koi pews. Yeah, um, I don't know about the spread. So I think the the main things are beaver are, are a native species to the UK. Mm. The, the koi pew aren't, and they they did create problems. Um, beaver are a native species, equally capable of, of creating problems. Less inclined to burrow and more inclined to build. Um, so. <laughs> They, they, they will dig into flood banks, there's, there's no doubt about that, but they're, they're less inclined to borrow the, than a koi poo. Um, they do breed more slowly, so a, a pair of beavers will, will produce maybe two kits a year for, for a few years. It's not... They, they, they don't explode. They, they breed reasonably steadily, but I, I don't think it's as quick as a koi poo. Um, and they will spread. They're, they're, they're very good travellers. They'll spread between catchments as seem to have done in Scotland there's no no doubt about that so 
Yes, some so, some similarities. Um, I think the the key thing for me is, is the benefits that, that beavers bring and the fact that they are a native species. There's a there's a lady with a hand up there. Thanks for that, Jen. Sorry, yes, hello. Waving a finger at me. <laughs> yes, hello. Um, I would just like your uh, thoughts on what you think the impact and the damage would be to the River Wensum if the building of the Norwich Western Link went ahead. I'm thinking that it's a four lane highway and a massive viaduct straddling the river. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And um, are you in any or in, in contact with the Norfolk County Council about this or have they been in contact with you? Because I would have thought that for that area, this is quite a, a, a massive issue. Yeah. Um, so it's very hard without having a lot of time to say exactly what the ecological impacts of that will be. Um, we've objected to it formally as Norfolk Rivers Trust um, because it will have an impact on the river and the wider catchment. I think that that's a key thing. It, it's not just the bit where it crosses the river, mm. it's, it's the impact it has on everything around it. Mm. So I think that's a big thing. Um, we, we know that there's been a recent study on exactly what is in road runoff from, from big roads and what that does to wildlife. So things like the brake dust and the, the things that tyres eventually break down into yeah. and the heavy particles that come out of exhaust. None of that's good and all that had come with, with a new road. And I learned at school in like 1984 that new roads attract more traffic. Um, but the, the, so we, we object to it and I can't say exactly what, what the ecological consequences would be. But the mad thing to me is, is the carbon costs of, of building it and the, the ongoing carbon costs of encouraging more car traffic. Um, hard, hard to say what it would do to the river, but generally environmentally, mm. it seems mad. Um, so, yeah, we, we objected to it formally. Um, but <laughs> we haven't really had any response to that. We, 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 we struggle for time with planning applications. Normally we don't touch them because it's not fair to get involved mm. unless you've got the time to read and understand what you're, what, what you're talking about, really. So we, we tend not to get involved in planning issues, but that, that one we did, yeah. Well, well, thank you very much for that. And could I just please ask all other participants this evening to look at the Stop the Wensome Link website for full information about the campaign and perhaps even contribute to the crowdfunder. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jen. I think Ian was next. Bless him, he's been... <laughs> <laughs> patiently waiting if anyone did have any questions just to stop um i don't want you guys to have to keep your hands up just pop it in the comments and we'll and we'll get to you i don't want anyone to feel left out sorry ian to, to... okay daniel th thanks very much jonah super super talk this evening thank you i'm chairman of narvas which is the narvalia ornithological society and we we kind of watch with interest i mean we've got the we've got the nar obviously and the gada and the WISI running through all through all through our sort of study area, we kind of watch with interest and sometimes with amusement uh, as to who who does what because somebody will say, "Oh, well, that's the environment," and you know, start doing a little bit of finger wagging. That oh, that's the environment agency. Oh, that's Natural England. No, that's that's all down to the Rivers Trust and probably other bodies as well. I was just wondering: is is there a simple explanation as to how? We used to actually have uh, get-togethers with, with all these groups, but do are they are they held together in some way? Is there a hierarchy as to where they where the way they work and, and are managing the rivers? It just seems that a lot of people could have a lot of fingers in in the pie, and one will straighten it, and the other one will put the meanders in, and you can't think what's going on. So, is there is there a simple explanation? Uh, that, that's that's my job. <laughs> <laughs> I, sp I spend all my career trying to work that stuff out. Um, the, the good thing is for the NAR, because it's a triple SI, Natural England have to have oversight of whatever's going on. So 
the the NAR has got quite messy because it's had a lot of funding available to it in recent years and it's split between the drainage board and the environment agency so we've done some work on it the, the drainage board are continuing to do good conservation work on it and um, the environment agency have done some work natural england do do stuff as well so it, it is it is messy and confusing and we, we got asked just this week who, who delivered a particular project angling water also have done work on the NAR, um, and we don't always know but the good news is that, that the Natural England have an oversight over the whole lot and they have to make sure it's, it's ecologically beneficial. So it, it's a bit messy. Um, the Wensum's possibly a better example. Um, that has got it, even more groups of people working on it than the NAR. But we're, we're all starting to work together as, as we are over quite a lot of Norfolk now. We, we've, we've got catchment groups that meet. Um, and we're, we're getting reasonably good as as conservationists at working together. But um, yeah, it, the the <laughs> the number of people that have worked on the River Nile in the last ten years is is um, quite extraordinary. I think it's all been good. There's, there's not much I wouldn't say was 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 really good work down there, but it's, it's confusing. Yeah. Thank you. Lovely. Were there any questions for anyone else before I start on my <laughs> running down my chat of questions? No? Okay, lovely. So sorry, Jonah, I have got a few. Um, <laughs> but that's that's always the way. Don't don't worry. Um, so a couple of a couple of ones which I'm sure um, a thorough look through the website would of course highlight these, but I thought I'd just get your um, your word on it in in the chat so that when people read it back, they have access to that. So. Are there many opportunities for local universities or scientists to study on the sites? Yes. Um, yeah, yes, there are. Every year we um, help or host a, a lot of student dissertations um, and anything from A-level through to PhD. So if, if that came from a student, just get in touch. Um, info at NorfolkRiversTrust.org um, or, or through the website or whatever. But yeah, definitely, yeah. And it's massively helpful to us and we recruit a lot of those or some of those people eventually so yes please fantastic really good route into the um into the sector there then yeah um so can can members of the public sponsor certain rivers schemes fish beavers anything like that is that something that you guys do hmm um yes and no so not really particular bits of river we, we don't own anything um, it, it's not like Norfolk Wildlife Trust where we've got reserves and bits of river. Um, it, it's all about convincing landowners to allow us to restore bits of river and then advise them on management. So we, we've never really had a scheme where people can adopt bits of river and we don't really have memberships. Well, we don't have memberships. Um, we do have occasional crowd funders. If you'd asked 48 hours ago, you could have contributed to the beaver crowd fund there but that's just closed um, and obviously we'll, we'll take donations that's that's fantastic anytime um so uh no no to the adopting bits of river um sometimes specific projects you can donate to or if you if there's something we do that you want to donate to just let us know and that, that'd be fantastic yeah good to know thank you sorry two more <laughs> two more um so what are your what are your kind of top three things that members of the public can do to help our waterways and in conjunction with that in terms of recorders you know are, are there a sort of do, do those top three things match what it, what is it that we can do to help the waterways wow um quite a lot of things um be careful what you put in your dishwasher and your toilet and your bath and your shower um if, if you can if you can go phosphate low or phosphate free so much the better um re reducing microplastics and i'm sure nobody in this audience does this but flushing things like baby wipes that don't break down that's one of the main reasons that sewage works break down and then overspill so just getting word out about that is is brilliant um if you own a river just be kind to the to the riverbank, please. Uh, don't, don't mow it and garden it. Just let it be a little bit wild. Um, and yeah, beyond that, I'm, I'm not sure really. Um, we, we run volunteer days and um, North Wildlife Trust do as well. So 
with anything like that yeah fantastic thank you i don't don't worry i always ask a top top some number of things that people can do so you're not you're not alone with putting you on the spot there um and then my final one um was obviously there's a limit of how many beavers we can release at the moment you said they um they breed one or two kits per year is there is there a risk that if we're not introducing enough that there's going to be some kind of genetic bottleneck in the future or do you think that yes okay i'll let you i'll let you answer that um yeah that that, that is a risk and a consideration um so beaver reintroductions have been going on well the, the beavers in kent have been there for 20 plus years now at ham fern um so they came in the, they came there was a population in an enclosure in kent and then a population in Scotland as well, then another population in Scotland. And I think they've been quite careful in bringing those from different stocks. I think initially in Poland and Scandinavia, and maybe Bavaria as well. And they're reasonably well managed. It's, it's mostly two people. It's mostly Derek Gow and Rasheen Campbell Palmer, who's his Scottish counterpart. And that they're pretty careful with their bloodlines and things. It is a risk, um, yes, definitely. But equally, it's happening quite quick. So I think most English counties now have beavers somewhere in them. Um, whether that's an, an illegal release, as they were in Devon, as, as they seem to have been in Kent, or an enclosed population, um, the National Trust have gone quite big on it. The Wildlife Trusts are going big on it so we've now got quite a few different populations dotted around the place so if those were initially well managed then that 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 should allow us to avoid that genetic bottleneck hopefully i think it, it must happen to an extent to beavers naturally because the most of them they, they will travel between catchments and meet other beaver families and move up and down stream but even so, I would think most beavers within a particular catchment would be reasonably closely related. Um, and some species do better with that than others. But yeah, that is potentially a massive, a massive problem and, and something that we have to keep an eye on. Thank you. I think Jim was next. Jim, if you want to take it away. You're on mute, Jim, I'm afraid. I'm not there, am I? Right. Um... Yeah, a few, 10 years ago, I think there was, um, oh, maybe even 20 now, there was a move to make a fish race in Norwich along the new mill area of Norwich where there was um, a pumping station, a Victorian pumping station. And I think it wasn't until 2017 that um, eels were detected on the upstream side of it. And I think there were only two <laughs> found. I mean, do you happen to know if that's improved, if things improved there? To an extent, yes. So at, at New Mills, that there's now an elver trap. So at, every year, the, the elvers migrate up about now, actually. Um, and for the next, well, through sort of April, May, June, July, every year, that there's an elver trap running there and a, a few other places around Norfolk. Um, and the trap, what, what must be a, a very small proportion of the elvers that are coming and get them over the weir um and it's it's, it's far from ideal and probably it helps about at a complete guess one percent or less of the incoming population but there's still going over in reasonable numbers it's it's hundreds or thousands of elvers get, getting over every year okay. and the they're, they're pretty amazing and they, they are getting caught higher up the wensum um, it, it, it's, it's, it's difficult. So the, there are real regulations now that, that mean anytime somebody do, does a bit of work to a structure like that, that work has to result in it becoming passable to eels. Um, so that's one thing that's going on. Yeah. We're also putting in eel passes and fish passes wherever we can. But for, for Norfolk Rivers Trust, doing three of those a year is... It, that, that, that's pretty big and for the environment agency doing one big scheme a year is also pretty big and there are literally hundreds and hundreds of, of, of barriers in Norfolk yeah. so it, it's it's hard 
Um, new mills is, a, is that that's a big big one and one that I know the environment agency the fisheries team are really keen to sort out and getting quite hopeful about doing it um so yeah it's 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 sad to think about the numbers and, and what's actually happening and how it's, long it's taken has been made it's taken so many years yeah Being years yeah so. Well, people have been aware since the Industrial Revolution that, that yeah. weirs stopped salmon getting through Sheffield, for example. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've known it. Um, yeah, and I, I think we're, we're properly at crisis point now, and, and I think the, these sort of things are, are picking up speed. Yeah, thanks. I hope. Please, do we have any further questions from anyone? I don't know if we've kept Jonah up. <laughs> Jonah from doing his his bedtime routine yet? Yeah, no. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Um, well, I just want to say, Jonah, thank you ever so much. Um, and I'm I'm sure Jonah wouldn't wouldn't mind, or the Rivers Trust wouldn't mind, if you have any further questions, to pop an email. Um, the contact details are on the website, or obviously yeah, if you've yeah. got them, the questions to us, we're happy to pass them on to. Um, but it's been an absolute pleasure to have you here this evening. Thank you so much for a, a very informative talk. Um, I, I certainly thoroughly enjoyed it. So thank you ever so much. And uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll let you go back to your um, <laughs> to your duties. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Danielle. Thanks, everybody. for, for Thanks. Thanks ever so much. Really good talk. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.